Local anesthetic systemic toxicity, or LAST, is a potentially fatal complication of local anesthetic use. The presentation can be variable, but a substantial number of these cases result in permanent injury or death, and understanding the ins and outs of this complication is a must for any clinician using local anesthetics. In this video, we'll review the mechanism, the clinical presentation, as well as strategies for prevention and management. LAST is an overdose of local anesthetic and happens either because we've accidentally put a big dose of local in a vessel or, for whatever reason, the local we've administered into the correct body compartment is just too much for that particular patient and the plasma levels hit a toxic threshold. Is this a rare complication? Maybe. Our best numbers suggest that it happens in one to two in every thousand nerve blocks. However, those are just the ones we know about from prospective registries or databases. There are no doubt several fold more cases that go unreported, especially if the outcome is favorable. Our understanding of how LAST presents has evolved over the last several decades, and especially in the era of ultrasound and fascial plane blocks. The classic presentation was based on rising levels of plasma local anesthetic and started with the prodromal symptoms, numbness around the mouth and tongue, ringing in the ears, a metallic taste, and some other non-specific neurologic items. Then, as plasma concentration increased, the patient would become agitated, restless, and start to twitch and eventually seize. Only the cases with the highest plasma levels would develop arrhythmias and cardiac pump failure. It's important to understand that while the syndrome can present in that specific order, it certainly doesn't have to. More contemporary data show that just under half of all cases present initially with neurologic signs and symptoms. Makes sense. A third present with both neurologic and cardiovascular manifestations at the same time. So that means that about a quarter percent with only cardiac signs. That's not good. In the old days, we kind of relied on the paradigm of hopefully I'll catch the last early because I'll watch for the prodrome. We know that's just not reliable anymore, and this speaks to the need to remain uber vigilant about preventing last. Another thing that's changed is where it happens. While the majority still occur in hospital, about 40% happen in ASCs, outpatient urology clinics, cosmetic surgery clinics, dental offices, and so on. As anesthesiologists, we used to own this complication because we were the ones using large volumes of local anesthetic and running into trouble. In the last 10 years, we've seen an uptick in the proportion of last due to surgeons and other proceduralists. At least part of that trend relates to tumescent anesthesia for liposuction. The site of injection seems to matter too, although that picture has changed slightly as well. A commonly taught list of injection sites ranked in order of potential for systemic absorption started with intercostal and epidural and ended with subcutaneous, and it made sense that these might represent a graded risk for last. More recent case reports suggest that procedures such as penile blocks in children and local infiltration analgesia for joint replacement are bigger culprits. This probably represents inattention to dosing limits relative to patient size. Neuraxial is still up there, as are upper extremity blocks and paravertebral blocks, but keep in mind that there is no site that is truly safe from last. The toxic mechanism is complicated and not fully understood. We do know that part of it relates to blockade of sodium channels in the heart and central nervous system, but there's also inhibition of other membrane ion channels, including potassium, calcium, and others. However, the primary toxic mechanism probably relates to poisoning of the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation pathway. To put it more simply, the cells just can't generate ATP for energy. They're metabolically asphyxiated. As you might expect, the organs that are most intolerant of intracellular energy depletion are the heart and brain, which is why the clinical syndrome manifests as cardiac and neurotoxicity. This mitochondrial poisoning theory may also explain why the usual hemodynamic therapies like vasopressors and inotropic drugs are frustratingly ineffective in severe last. In the brain, high local anesthetic levels first provoke blockade of inhibitory neurons in the cortex, which leaves the excitatory pathways unrestrained. This explains the twitching, hallucinations, and seizures that characterize neurotoxicity. At a higher threshold plasma level, the excitatory neurons get blocked too, resulting in CNS depression and coma. In the heart, we see sodium channel blockade of conducting fibers, which provokes either bradycardia or reentrant tachyarrhythmias. There's also a direct myocardial depressant effect from calcium channel blockade and interference with the myocardial sodium calcium channel pump. Add on to that the mitochondrial poisoning, and you can see how the heart muscle begins to fail fast. Now, we have an antidote for this poisoning, fat. Specifically, a 20% emulsion of triglycerides and phospholipids. It's amazing for its sheer effectiveness at reversing the toxic changes after local anesthetic poisoning, and the fact that it's cheap and plentiful makes it all the more attractive. So how does lipid emulsion work? It's actually multimodal, but the first and principal way it works is by scavenging lipid-soluble local anesthetic molecules from the heart and brain tissue and shuttling them to other tissue depots, notably the high-mass, high-flow skeletal muscle and liver. 
This lowers the concentration of local anesthetic at the ion channels in the heart and brain, and when that concentration drops sufficiently, the tissues can begin to function again. The triglycerides also provide fatty acid substrate for the poisoned mitochondria to use, providing a little inotropic kick. There's also a volume effect from the colloidal lipid emulsion that helps generate cardiac output, so it really does work in a couple different ways. When we think about populations that may be at higher risk for last, the extremes of age seem to be in that category. Elderly people have cardiac comorbidities that result in a lower threshold for rhythm disturbances or pump failure. They also have decreased muscle mass, which means they're unable to use that as a neutral reservoir for local anesthetics. Babies under six months of age have decreased muscle mass too, as well as immature hepatic bile transformation pathways, so plasma levels of local anesthetic may be elevated, particularly since they also have reduced concentrations of alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, a protein that binds local anesthetics in the plasma. For both the frail elderly and children less than six months of age, a dose reduction of local anesthetic of 10 to 20% seems reasonable. Pregnant patients have a reduced concentration of plasma binding proteins and increased cardiac output, which translates to a more rapid rise to peak plasma levels. Add to that the epidural venous engorgement from the mass effect of the uterus, and it seems reasonable to reduce the epidural dose by 10 to 20%, starting in the first trimester. Patients with reduced ventricular function will be more susceptible to local anesthetic-induced myocardial depression, and they won't clear local as fast. Those that already have arrhythmias are at slightly higher risk for developing a serious arrhythmia with last two. Coronary disease doesn't seem to be a risk in and of itself, but remember that you need to feed fat to the heart in a cardiac arrest situation, and if that muscle is poorly perfused because of sclerotic blockages, it will prolong the resuscitation. We don't want to have to manage last, so it pays to prevent it. First off, be conscious of published dose limits. There are obviously downsides to a set of limits that don't take into account the site of injection or other patient factors. However, they're a good framework to work from. It's scary to see that there are plenty of reports of last with sub-maximal doses. A good rule is to use the lowest dose possible that gets the analgesia you need. Fractional injection means pausing between each 4 to 5 mil aliquot for 20 to 30 seconds to allow the plasma concentration to begin to fall. This is a good safe practice. It can be somewhat impractical with small volume blocks and will typically do this for the elderly patient with multiple risk factors or high volume blocks. Always aspirate before injecting each dose. It's not perfect, there are some false negatives, but they're rare. Epinephrine is used as a marker for inadvertent intravascular injection. We put it in virtually every local anesthetic syringe and have had some good saves where we were obviously mistaken as to the needle tip position. Epinephrine also truncates the peak plasma level of local anesthetics. And finally, use ultrasound. We now have evidence that ultrasound-guided blocks are associated with a significantly reduced incidence of last over a non-ultrasound technique, so use it. Three special situations deserve a brief mention. Fascial plane blocks carry a somewhat higher risk for last for two reasons. One, the target intermuscular fascial plane is sandwiched between two reasonably vascular muscle bellies, and so uptake is relatively quick depending on the individual block. We also use large volumes such as 80 mils total for a bilateral set of blocks. In these cases, it's wise to dilute the local anesthetic down to stay well within dosing guidelines. The nerves in these blocks are generally quite small and easily blocked with dilute local anesthetic. Catheters are wonderful, but be aware that most of the data we have to date shows that the total plasma levels of ropivacaine do continue to rise for the duration of the catheter, and so care should be taken when planning the infusion regimen. Again, the least amount of local possible to get the job done is the right dose. Fortunately, the alpha-1 acid glycoprotein also rises following surgery, so while the total plasma level may be high, the actual free fraction is not as high as you might think. Special care should be taken with multiple catheters. Intravenous lidocaine has been the culprit in a number of serious last cases. Even in normal doses, over 10% of patients report mild CNS or cardiovascular disturbances. A recent international consensus statement has recommended that infusion rates go no higher than 1.5 milligrams per kilogram per hour and only infuse for 24 hours. A block should not be performed within four hours of starting or finishing the infusion. The worst happened and you've got a case of last. What are your first steps? First, stop injecting the offending poison. Call for help and if you have a lipid emulsion kit prepared, call for that specifically. Maintain the airway and, if necessary, ventilate the patient. The seizure produces a profound hypercarbic state, which vasodilates the cerebral arteries, promoting the delivery of the very agent we want to avoid to the brain. You want to aim for eucapnea or slight hypocapnia. Stopping the seizure is important, and benzodiazepines are the first line. 2 mg of midazolam is usually sufficient. Propofol should be used sparingly, as it will have a negative effect on blood pressure and cardiac output. 
At this point, you're going to want to give the lipid. I recommend delegating one individual to manage the lipid portion of the resus. Direct him or her to withdraw 1.5 mils per kilo using some big syringes. This is your bolus dose and you want to get it in quick. Once the bolus is finished, direct him or her to start the infusion at 0.25 mils per kilo per minute. Up to two more boluses of the same dose can be given if needed, and the infusion rate doubled if there's refractory hypotension, but the maximum dose is 12 mils per kilo. Now, doing math in the middle of a crisis is no fun, so here's an easy math-free version that will approximate your bolus and infusion, assuming an ideal body weight of 70 kilos, 100 mil bolus, and 1,000 mils per hour on the pump. In the heat of the recess, just get things going with those two settings, and then once the dust has settled, you can fine-tune your infusion if needed. Lipid emulsion is very well tolerated, and there are sufficiently few side effects that most experts recommend giving it at the first hint of last. You may overtreat some patients who are false positives, but given that last can progress quickly, you really don't want to take that chance. If you have the clinical suspicion, give the lipid. It's nice to have your lipid and the instructions in one place. Here's an example from lipidrescue.org where the lipid is in a sealed box with instructions pasted to the top. In a cardiac arrest setting, everything else is the same, but you'll want to carry on with standard ACLS. Standard except for the following. Don't use a milligram of epinephrine. All it does is provoke arrhythmias, wildly increase cardiac work, impairs gas exchange, and provokes a rise in lactate. The goal here is to get flow of lipid through the coronaries, so chest compressions are key. Don't use vasopressin, as it has been shown to worsen outcomes. And obviously, you wouldn't use lidocaine to treat arrhythmias in the setting of LAST. And similarly, don't use meds that reduce the inotropy or AV conduction. Once you've had the patient back and stable for 10 minutes, you can stop the lipid infusion. If the patient has experienced cardiovascular compromise, he or she should be monitored for at least 6 hours to ensure the heart and brain are no longer at risk from redistribution. If there were only neurologic manifestations, 2 hours is enough. If the episode was brief and not severe, it may be best to proceed with surgery, especially if the patient has already been blocked and the block is sound. On the other hand, in cases where the patient is not responding to these measures, consider calling in the cavalry and getting cardiopulmonary bypass or ECMO deployed. Here's a flowchart for last management from the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. And this is a similar guideline from the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland. Both are very similar. LAST is a terrible complication of local anesthetic use that, with the right preventive strategies and vigilance, can be avoided. Make sure you're prepared in any setting you use local anesthetics.